Well, hello, good morning once again. We are here with our two dynamic elders every Tuesday morning right here in Whispering Hope. We are so glad that you came back to view once again. We thank you for your commitment and for you continuing to share the link and subscribing to the Whispering Hope channel. We are here this morning to go into another lesson study and we're just going to pray that the Lord will guide us and guide you as you view and as you engage this morning's lesson. So, Elder Jacqueline Gordon and Elder Andy David, I want to say welcome to both of you. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning as usual. We're happy to, I'm happy to be here. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here as usual. Trust that we'll have a blessed time this morning as we study. Excellent. And so, before we get into anything further, I'm going to invite the Lord's presence to be with us as we discuss the lesson today. And so I'm going to ask Elder David to give us our prayer. And Elder Gordon, could you just read for us the memory text for this week? And then we'll get into today's lesson specifically. Let us pray. Well, loving heavenly, what an awesome privilege it is that we could come together again to study a word. Dear Lord, as we study this morning, we invite your Holy Spirit to come by and interpret your word to us this morning. Grant the Lord that as we study today that we'll find your will. We ask the God that as we see your will for our lives today in this study, help us to determine in our hearts by your Holy Spirit's power to apply it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our memory text is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. All right, excellent. So we're looking today, Tuesday, at the lesson entitled Crucibles of Sin. Crucibles of Sin. That sounds very interesting. Or maybe I should say that sounds very sinful. <laughs> Crucibles of Sin. Because you would have understood by now, and this is the second lesson in this installment, this quarter, that a crucible is a particular dish or device or bowl of some sort, container, receptacle, whatever, make your choice, that is used put in substances that are going to go through a, a fair amount of heat or, or temperature increase and it's going to be burnt or quote-unquote cooked or purified. And so a crucible is a crucible. And yet still, the topic for today is crucibles of sin. Now, we know sin is deadly. Sin leads to death. So elders, we're in for something this morning. And our viewers, hold on to your seats because what is the crucibles of sin? So we are looking at a particular passage of scripture today, Romans 1 and verse 18. But before we get into that, I'm going to just circle back and come back to this. I would like for Elder Gordon to give us your take on the memory text which you read this morning, the memory text for the week. And as we, you get into maybe a summary of it, maybe some insight of the memory text, what is it that you'd like to point out from the memory text for this week? And then Elder David, you could add to it or multiply. Elder Gordon? From the memory text, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, it is advising us that we should not be too worried or concerned about the difficult things that will happen to us, especially as children of God. We are reminded that fiery trial will come, but when they come, we should not suffer or believe as if life is over. We should not cave in. I know it is difficult to use those words and apply them, but when we see God, when we look upon God's suffering, we will recognize that we through are going through the same suffering as Christ went through and just as he too was victorious he conquered hell death and the grave he stood up for righteousness in spite of the temptations and the slap and the piercing on the cross everything that he went through he did not sin we know the bible says and the bible says 
and basically from 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of God's law. Sin is going against what God stands for, his character, his law. And once, if we commit sin, well, we are destroyed and we will go through punishment. We will go through the wrath because of what we have done. But I think here, the memory text is speaking to uh, specifically to those who are walking after Christ, to those who are followers of Christ. Yes, we are following Christ, tough times will come, but we are reminded from the memory text, when they come, we must rejoice and be glad because we too are partakers of Christ's suffering. Excellent, Elder David. There are times when people tend to think that when you become Christians, when you're following Jesus, that it is going to be a bed of roses. It's going to be free from difficulties. But Peter is here saying, that, look, that is not so. He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which, which uh, is to try you. Now, what he's saying, look, sufferings, or trials are not alien, or Christians are not alien to trials. They are part and parcel. They belong together. When once you become Christians, you are going to go through trials. It's inevitable. And why it's inevitable? Because I was reading my favorite author, and she was saying, look what? Trials are God's favorite means of perfecting his children for his kingdom and i guess that is why it is said at the end of the, the passage here we read that when his glory is revealed revealed or uh, you also may be glad with exceeding joy because having gone through trials our characters would have been tried and tested and developed to the point where we are ready to meet our lord to go home with jesus so the trials in essence it prepares us it helps our, it develops our character so trials are inevitable. I don't know of any other way that a Christian can grow and develop uh, faith in Jesus other than going through trials and watching Jesus come through for us or bring us through our trials. All right, thank you. And while you're on the mic, Elder David, the follow-up question would be that we see in Romans 1 verse 8 where Paul is writing to the church in Rome and he says, for the wrath of God is revealed. Now, now, this is what Paul says. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, tell me, help us out here, Elder David. Is it God placing serious wrath on us when we do things contrary to his will or as Paul says here, when we suppress the truth in unrighteousness? Does God send real tough times of destruction upon individuals or is there something that is naturally outflowing from our consequences help help us to understand this text now, reading this at first glance looking at this at first glance it may look as though or sound as though when we sin god is looking for ways and means to penalize us because we sin all right, it's looking at it says the wrath of God is revealed. It seems as though God is looking for the harshest punishment for sinners when they sin, but that is not the case. Now, sin has natural consequences, and so that when we sin, what we do now, God has promised to take care of us, He has promised to protect us. The Bible tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all things will be added to you with uh, protection your needs will be provided when once we seek him when once we live within his will but when we step out of god's will when we decide to live a life of sin then we would have removed ourselves from god's protection from his provision and so on and when once we remove ourselves naturally the natural consequences of sin will take over so when the bible says the wrath of god would be revealed the wrath of god there is really talking about the natural consequences that will follow when one when once we remove ourselves from the, the protection of god 
Excellent. The natural consequences, the natural outflow of our choices. Friends, when you make a choice in life, it has a consequence. The consequence may be wonderful, beautiful, glorious life with Christ, or the consequence could be the contrary of that. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back as we look into this lesson further this morning. We'll be right back in a second. And may your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles in the way they should. And may your bad days. And welcome back. We are discussing this morning the crucibles of sin, crucibles of sin. And uh, before the break, Elder David was talking about the natural consequences that we face having chosen things contrary to God, or the natural consequences if we were to choose God. Paul gives a litany, I call it a litany, or a lengthy passage or description of people who fall into sin and their consequences. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 21 to 32. This is a bit lengthy, so I won't have you read it, but for those who are watching, you can read this um, either after the, the study, or well, after the study, of course, not before. Um, Romans 1, 21 to 32. Paul describes a process where people fall into sin and the consequences of those sins. And it gives very specific individuals or lifestyles that are listed there by Paul. So he says to read these verses prayerfully and carefully and summarize the essence of what Paul is saying, focusing specifically on the stages of sin and its consequences. So there are certain stages of sin that Paul is talking about. And I know you might, might have read this before, Elder Gordon, but give us a summary as to what is it that Paul is speaking about here in terms of falling into sin. Because after all, today, the topic of discussion is crucibles of sin. So help us out here, Elder Gordon. Yes, so as stated earlier, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So as Elder David was ably describing, the consequences of sin leads to death. But to answer your question, I would like to at least read verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. It says... For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And listen to this part. Uh, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So what that is saying, as God, as Paul um, he gives a litany of the progressive nature of sin, it is saying that we know better. God has revealed himself through one, I think Paul named it, creation. When we look upon creation, the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, we know for sure that God is revealed in the element of everything he has created. We go further. When God created man from the dust of the earth and breathed into man's nostril the breath of life, man became a living soul. And God, it is saying here, when Paul looked and Paul recognized, you know better. We know better, but yet still we turn from the creator and started worshiping God's created beings. We started, and there's another part, it goes on, it says, and we changed verse 23 and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So we're changing who God is. And I think that stems from what Satan did in the garden of the Ad Adam and Eve, when he tempted Eve. He said, you sh God knows that the day you eat of this fruit, you will be as gods. That was Satan's plan. The Bible says he's a liar from the beginning. And so we see that progression coming down here where we know who God is. 
We know that he's the creator. We know without him, nothing was made and nothing will ever be made. But yet still, in order to allow that seed that Satan planted to germinate in our lives, we continue. And so what man is doing now and did then during Paul's time come right up, we change from the creator to the created beings, the, the, the forfeited beasts, and all these crawling things. And mankind suppressed the truth and started to worship these things. And I would just like to conclude with Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 10, where the Bible itself says that not it was no ordinary men. And this is what we have to understand. It wasn't just ordinary people who did not know any better. When we look at Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 10, the Bible says, so I went, that's the Ezekiel here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. In other words, the priests, they were in the sanctuary and they had all these images held upon of all these creeping things and four-footed beasts. And the Ezekiel saw them, had the census. And they're having the smoke, worshiping them, and their face were to the sun, worshiping the S-U-N rather than the S-O-N. All right, excellent. Now, Elder David, I'm reading from uh, the New International Version, and I'm reading Romans chapter 1, I'm reading verse 24. Now, this question is for you, Elder David, and I want you to help us out to understand something here. Romans 1 verse 24 says... Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. Verse 26 says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Verse 28 says, furthermore, just as they did not think it wor worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. Elder, I'm seeing a common phrase here. We say God gave them over. God gave them up. God gave them over. Help us. Is God giving up on people here? God doesn't give up on anybody. Quite the opposite. We give up on God. Now, they would have, as, as, as was mentioned by Elder God, and as the Bible says, the people know or they knew what was right. They knew God as creator. They knew that they were supposed to worship God as creator, but yet they, they refused to do that. As a result of that, they, they, they followed their own way. And the spirit would have pleaded with them repeatedly, but they continue to go their own way. If the spirit continues to plead with you and you continue to reject the spirit, after a while, his voice becomes fainter and fainter, and you don't hear him anymore. And so you are left now up to your own desires and and that is a that is a dangerous place to get so after that there is no god in their thoughts they are following their own sinful desires and keep in mind the bible tells us that we were born in sin and we were shaped in iniquity so that is all that we have to go by and as a result of of, of god giving them over as a result of them not hearing the holy spirit speak to them again following their own hearts the bible tells us that they fell into sexual immorality, all right? Because they were just following, following their own sinful lusts. And we saw what the Bible says, the kind of sexual sins that they got involved in. And, you know, as I looked at this, I couldn't help but notice what is happening in our world today as far as sexual immorality is concerned. We live today in a sex-crazy world. People are just doing anything, all right, as regards to sex. And that has to be because of what Paul is saying here. God is no longer in their thoughts. They're not being guided. They're not being directed by God and his word. So they're left to their own. So we have an example in the world today of people who left to their own sinful lusts. And the result, Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If that word is not there, then we are left on our own and left on our own with our sinful desires. We see what is happening. We see what is the result. 
Now we ought to be careful. And as I studied this, I, I thought, look, I ought to always ensure that I am guarding the avenues of my soul. Be careful what I look at. Be careful what I feed myself with. Be careful who has control of my mind. Otherwise, I can end up just like, like, like these people. All right. So thank you, Elder. We're looking at, you know, the consequences of going against God's moral law. We've been looking at sinning in that way. We're looking at crucibles of sin for today. But not just the moral law, the other laws, health laws, the laws about our bodies, about how we have to take care of the temple that God gave to us. And so we need to look at it in a wholesome perspective, because after all, God gave us all that we have and all that we are. And we've got to take care of what God has given to us as good stewards. But we'll come back after this break and we'll wrap up in the last nine minutes or so as we look at some more personal application towards today's lesson as we complete the lesson for this morning. We'll be right back after this. I've had many tears and sorrows Had questions for tomorrow There have been times I didn't know right from wrong But in every situation God gave blessed consolation That my trials come to only make me strong Welcome back in this last segment of our discussion, we're going to be looking at how we can apply today's lesson in a more personal or practical sense. And so we're going to start with Elder Jacqueline Gordon, and we're going to look at this particular application or this question. Elder Gordon, in your own life, now you don't have to give us all the integrity, all of the details, but in your own life, how have you reaped the immediate consequences? Now, let me read that over carefully. How have you reaped the immediate consequences of your own sins. <laughs> I don't know if you want to reveal that one to us in the garden, but you can give us a general sense. In your own life, how have you reaped the immediate consequences of your own sins? What lessons have you learned in the garden? And what changes must you make in order to not to go through something similar again? And this question applies to Elder David as well. Every time you ask a question about reaping the consequence of on a personal level, my sin, I mean, it, it, it happens so often. I mean, I've learned so many lessons. I've learned so many things. I slap myself all the time and I say, you know better, you know better, you know better. But what encourages me, and, and even as we look at Romans chapter 1, our text for this week and our subtopic of the crucible of sin, I am so reminded that it is I on a personal level. You know better. I know better. God expects me to do better. P Peter, Paul, as he wrote, he was writing to those who would have known God. If we know God, then we ought to walk in the light. How do we find the light? The light is found in the word of God. David says the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Yes, I know I'm speaking on a personal level. Sometimes you get up and you someone rob you of that joy. Someone at the workplace, wherever it is, you just feel as if you're robbed of that joy. And sometimes, Elder Vaughan, I feel like retaliating. I know God said vengeance is mine, but sometimes something happened and I just decide, let me stand up for myself, not waiting upon God. And oftentimes, even during the moment of standing up for myself, something in my conscience is saying, no, 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 but you still suppress that and still go on to take vengeance and, and things like that. But daily, as I tabernacle with God, especially when I see God first thing in the morning, do as Jesus did, that first in the morning experience of worshiping God, just go into his word. His word magnifies in my life. And you, I can easily say, Lord, forgive 
forgive me. And I'm so thankful that God is a God who forgives, that God is a God who constantly reaches out after us. And even as we look at the topic of the wrath of God, Elder, the wrath of God is really his way of causing us to come back to him so that we can be burned by the consequence of our sin, so that something that happened to us during the difficult times, so that we can say, let me turn around and go back to God. So that is what God's wrath is all about, to yield, to cause us to repent and go back to him. And on a personal level, I'm so thankful. So constantly I say, Lord, forgive me because I know once I ask for forgiveness, he's willing and able to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The same thing can happen to anyone this morning. Just say, Lord, forgive me. And he is willing and able to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Elder David, your turn. The lesson says that we can offend by breaking the health laws also. I would like to look at it from that perspective in terms of what I consequences that I would have felt because of my actions. I had this dirty habit of eating late in the night. And I realized that I was developing acid reflux. And I jumped on it quickly, went to the doctor. He gave his recommendations. As a result of that, I tried to not eat anything after seven in the evening anymore. And I am better today for it. So that is where I violated and I felt the consequences. But one other thing, and I guess you can take this as my closing thought also. Today we're looking at the crucibles of sin. Now, because of our sins, or our sins, sometimes we can create crucibles for ourselves. And, and God is a really loving, gracious God. But in spite of all of that, we are turning from him by sinning against him and so on. And he takes the same sin and use it as a means of us coming back to him. So because of the, the sins, we create a crucible. And when once we go through that crucible, once we go through those struggles, God allow us to go through those struggles. And then we reach out to him. And loving and merciful as he is, he's always willing and ready to welcome us back. So we, because of our sins, can create crucibles. And those same crucibles can lead us back to God. God is a loving, merciful God. I would not, we would not create crucibles ourselves. But when once we do, God sometimes uses the same crucible to save us. God is a loving and merciful God. Amen to that. He is a loving and merciful God. And we see today that, as you said so quite rightly, Elder David, that it is we ourselves who, because of our choices, that those crucibles may come. And so as we go on in the week and we look at the other day's lesson with other hosts to come on this program, we're going to look at other aspects of it. But for today, yes, the crucibles of sin. When we sin, there are consequences. When we choose to do contrary to God's word, there are consequences. And it is not a case, my friends, where God is looking at his children who have sinned and he's taking stones and throwing at them as they go down the road, as he run them out of the house and tell them, don't come back here. It is not a case where God is casting aspirations and, 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 and kicking you out. But God, when some people are bent on choosing what they want to choose, the book of Romans and Paul the Apostle makes it very clear under the inspiration of God that God will relent and let you choose, let the consequences run naturally. And that is how we speak of God today and always. God allows you, he's a perfect gentleman, to do your thing when you have chosen to do so and you have made up your mind. Mm -hmm. Don't choose to go contrary to God. Be on his side. He is the one that can lead us into greener pastures. He's the one that leads us beside still waters. He restores your soul. Trust in him. I want to thank elders David and Gordon for continuing to be uh, inspiration to all of us here on this program and for giving us insights into the word of God. We thank you so much for joining us. May God continue to bless you. Remember to like, subscribe, and share this link on Whispering Hope. Have a wonderful day.